Thanks, Alan, and everybody. Welcome to New York, if you're not from here originally. <laughs> I, I, I'm the New York appointed speaker, uh, at least for the moment. And uh, you know, Arnold is, uh, is the person with whom I had shared an office with in the Supreme Court, Nassau County, um, and later shared an office with the twins' older brother, Jerry Collin. Um, I was never permitted to share an office with Bill because Bill was too special for those things. <laughs> but uh, you know, we and so I'm I'm, I'm quite close with with the Collins, with the family, and and have uh, an enormous amount of respect for them uh, from the standpoint that we all do as professionals, but also uh, having had the opportunity to work uh, elbow to elbow with each of them. A couple of things I thought that you might be interested in in terms of their background, in case you didn't know it, Bill is a self-taught stenotypist. He didn't attend any formal school. Uh, their dad was uh, first a, an admitted attorney, but also became a teacher of shorthand. Four brothers in the family, Ephraim, I'm given to understand, wrote phonography, Pittman shorthand, and gave it up after a while. But Jerry and the twins stayed with stenotype, uh, converting to that after a while. Um, you know, some of the things that, uh, that that Bill is known for, I don't have to really share with you. You know about their speed contest victories, and I'm sure that Bill will share with you uh, the one dramatic uh, uh, 1952 uh, contest when there was this unprecedented, either before or after, tie. I was going to talk about tape. that. <laughs> and, but I, that is something that should be spoken about by people other than I, and I'll leave that to Harold to, to, to share with you. Five minutes, Harold. <laughs> um, they, they, there's so much. But uh, you know, one of the things that I'm, I'm here to tell you is that Bill is not flawless. You know, what? No, I'm, I'm sorry. You know, I, I told you, I, I know him from a different standpoint than most of you have had the opportunity to. He is not flawless. You know, his brother, for example, spent over 60 years in one civil service position, but not Bill. Bill, after 20 some odd years, left the Supreme mm -hmm. Court. He retired. I don't understand how that word ever entered into his vocabulary and went off to the big, big courthouse in Manhattan, the federal court. And he stayed there for another 24, 5, 6, 7 years. And then he retired. You just can't keep a job, this young man. <laughs> I, I, I never could understand it. You know, as opposed to his twin, who just stayed in one place. He, he was rather stable. Um, you know, uh, Marvin Birnbaum wrote an article, and I, and I, I couldn't put my fingers on it. Um, and and I'm, I'm sure that I'm glad that, that I heard you're going to speak to it, and that's great because I, I, I don't I don't have that article. But he, he shared a number of things from his standpoint of working with Bill that were just marvelous. I'm glad to hear that, that, that Harold's going to, to spend some time talking to you about that. Um, you, sh you should know a couple of things, though, um, uh, some other things about Bill. Um, you know, he, he, uh, there was a time when he was inducted into the New York State Court Reporters Hall of Fame uh, shortly after that position, uh, that, that award first came about. Um, and as part of that, uh, the then president of the New York State Court Reporters Association, and by the way, we have present with us, um, Gene Beskin, past president of the New York State. We have with us Donald White, past president of the New York State. Raise your hand so we know who you are. And current president of the New York State Association, Harriet Brenner, gentleman, who is transforming this association to something really respectable. But then the president, Don White, in giving that award to Bill, commented that Bill demonstrates the very best that we can be to each other. So you're going to hear a lot of superlatives today, but I want you to hear some very human comments about Bill. Um, there's one thing that I just came across uh, this week that I, I, I really wanted to share with you. Um, I heard about it many years ago and forgotten about it, but there was a time when uh, Bill was in basic training. Uh, in the U.S. Army, uh, stationed in Atlantic City. And that was a time when he and Arnold started perfecting their skills as stenotypists. They practiced every day religiously for an hour or two, reading to each other and so forth. But one story that really does not come out of that often is the fact that they had a physical training instructor who ultimately would become 
a gentleman who would play a game called baseball and would hit in 56 mm -hmm. consecutive baseball games. The name was Joe DiMaggio. Oh. And one of Bill's wishes was that he would have attended 56 NCRA conventions. As of this year, Bill attended his 56th NCRA. In the same breath. In the same breath. Ladies and gentlemen, we love him, we respect him. He has guided us and given us motivation and things to shoot for and to emulate, which we probably would not have had without him. Bill, happy birthday for more. Yes. The New York State Court Reporters Association, the oldest reporting association in the United States, hereby recognizes with dignity and admiration, the 90th birthday of past president William Cohn, 1963, is when he was the president. For more than seven decades, Mr. Cohn has guided and in determinant a number of reporters by his countless seminars, professional committee work, and instructional articles, innumerable, innumerable others were motivated by his outstanding achievements. The most outstanding of his peers consider Bill one of the best reporters ever. Highlights of Mr. Cohn's legendary career reported the Japanese war crimes trial, Manila, New York State Supreme Court reporter, Mi Mineola, New York, 1949 through 1972, U.S. District Court reporter, Southern District, New York, 1972 to 2000, freelance reporter, 2000 to the present, this young man still works. <laughs> National Shorthand Reporters Association, that's the old NCRA, um, 1955, 1956, 1957, um, chaired, okay. <laughs> chaired uh, NCRA speak contest for 40 subsequent years. Peer recognition, NCRA 1969 Distinguished Service Award, and NSCRA, New York State Court Reporter, Lewis Goldstein Memorial, NSDSA Award, and NCRA Founding Fellow, 1975. In honor of this event, the officers and board of the New York State Court Reporters Association extend to William Cohn, who was born on November 14, 1943. Woo. Our most sincere birthday wishes and our deepest appreciation for his many years of tireless dedication to our timeless profession. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, should I say something? Nice. You'll have your turn. <laughs> <laughs> Let me introduce myself. I'm Ed Morello, now here, now from uh, Boston, Massachusetts. It's great to be in a room where I'm not the oldest person. <laughs> We're the spring chickens. <laughs> By the way, I'm here with my lovely wife, Nancy, who is of NCRA. So I'm looking around the room and adding up five minutes apiece and saying, nope, that's too long. <laughs> I'm going to set the tone by being less than that. And I'd love to go through a highlight of Bill's career and his accomplishments, but we'll never get out of here if I do that. So I'm going to simply comment to you about how Bill has influenced my life. I first met Bill, well, actually, I met him in 1964 when he conducted a seminar and I attended. And I was much impressed with him, he spent some time with me, and I was flattered by that. And the next year, 1965, on my 19th birthday, I passed the merit exam. So I was a young hotshot. Very exciting, very exciting for me. Bill came to me at that lunchtime at the convention in Atlantic City, sat with me at lunch along with Matt Weiss, and probed me. How do you practice? What do you find difficult? What do you find works for you? He took an interest in me. Well, I can tell you, I don't remember a thing that I said at that lunch because I think I was tongue-tied. I probably didn't say anything. Bill was my idol. There's no doubt about it. That's the correct word to use. He was my idol. He's the one who got me interested in speed contests. But more importantly, Bill did for me what any good role model does. He made me want to be the best that I could be. Bill has done that for countless people, court reporters, throughout the last 50 years. And he did it for me. 
he got me interested in court reporting, he got me interested in being the best writer I could be, and more importantly, over the years and the interest that he took in me and the interest that he took in all of us in the speedy contest and court reporters generally, he made me realize that there was nothing too small to pay attention to in order to achieve excellence. Excellence was the goal every day, whether you were competing in speed contests or doing your job as a freelancer or an official. He did imbue me with the idea that excellence is the only thing that's acceptable, and it becomes a habit. It's a great habit to get into. We'd all be better off as a profession if everybody took the attitude that excellence is the only acceptable default for everyday work. So, of course, it's a lot of fun. He ran the speed contest for years, and we were all happy, all of us in the speed contest, a very small fraternity. We were always happy to see Bill run the contest because we knew it would go right. And we would have fun with Bill. There would always be a practice session the day before the contest that Bill would be dictating. Everybody's hunched over their machines. Speed contestants are very intense people, especially the day before. <laughs> so we're hunched over our machines, and Bill said, this is going to be a 220 literary. Holds up his stopwatch. Well, 220 literary is tough, so we're all hunched over. We're ready. The stopwatch clicks. Bill starts reading. You can hear the machines. This is the old days, the mechanical clack. machines. You can hear the machines <laughs> clack, clack, clacking around the room. And Bill is reading a mile a minute in French. <laughs> And all of a sudden, Bill looks up at us, he stopped talking, and says, what are you people writing? <laughs> I, want to, I want to tell you, Bill, I've always appreciated that. And I, and I borrow from you. That is really awesome. Because I've done it for my, uh, well, I've been dictating to people, except my fake French is not as good as your fake French. And I've enjoyed it. I want to thank you, Bill. I've talked long enough now. I want to thank you for being the role model that you have been for me. I hope that I've passed on the tradition of excellence to others that I got from you. I think that the people who know you and have been influenced you by and core reporting have an incomparable debt to pay to you. It's nice to be here on your 90th birthday to celebrate it with you, and thank you. <clears throat> I thought, you know, I don't know Bill as well as a lot of people in this room, so what can I say about Bill? And I remembered one time when the Boston Globe called my husband Ed the Michael Jordan of court reporting. So I started thinking, what other icons out there could describe Bill? And the first one that came to mind because of all his work in education was Vince Lombardi. And Vince Lombardi was the ultimate coach. He got the best out of his players. He never had a losing season ever in his career. I think that describes Bill. He gets the best out of his students, and a lot of people in this room can attest to that. So thank you for being that coach. The second one that came to mind totally surprised me when I started hearing the reference to baseball today was Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth made baseball what it is today. He made home run the ultimate goal, and I think Bill and his speed contest work and his work with all the reporters around here, he's got a lot of home runs in this room. He's got a lot of career home runs as Harriet Red. So I think between Vince Lombardi and Babe Ruth, we've got the best of the sports world here. And I appreciate you, Bill. And on behalf of the NCRA board, the NCRA staff, and the 18,000 members who don't know it but need our icons and need our role models, I thank you from all of them. Good afternoon. My name is Irv Starkman. I'm from Philadelphia. Uh, I must say, before I give a few words about Bill, to follow the virales to me is something so, so special because years ago, I, when I was brand new in reporting, I had the guts to go in the evenings over to the Varallo office and sit there and practice with the Varallos. Wow. And to tell you the truth, I thought they were speaking French. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, my fellow reporters and friends. As President John Fitzgerald Kennedy said, and so my fellow Americans, Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. If I may change something, and so my fellow reporters, ask not what your profession can do for you. Ask what you can do for your profession. Bill Cohen epitomizes that expression. 
He is a man of distinction. Bill and his twin brother Arnold won six straight speed championships held by the National Shorthand Reporters Association and reached an incredible 280 words per minute on the stenotype machine. I'm sure I don't know Bill for as long a period as some of you in this room. I only know him for 53 years. <laughs> Whenever I saw him, I felt like I had to bow down because the king entered. He always showed me the highest respect, as I did for him. I respected him for his command of the English language. He is a master of words. As former United States Attorney General Michael B. Mukasey said regarding Bill, a gentleman down to his fingertips. You, sir, have the Midas touch. Everything you touch turns to gold. I thank you, Bill, for your dedication to the court reporting profession. You have helped so many reporters in all phases of the profession. I get about 220 words a minute. <laughs> <laughs> my friend Al. President Barack Obama said, we did not come to fear the future, we came here to shape it. You sure did that, my friend. Bill, I want to wish you a very happy birthday and many more to come. Zyg is in and all your future endeavors. Well, the first thing I want to say is, we all heard that Bill is still working. Well, believe it or not, he was supposed to work today. <laughs> Nobody knows this except me. He had to give up his job because we're going to honor him on his 90th birthday. <laughs> Amazing. That's number one. And number two, I asked him many, many years ago when I went to the court in Mineola the substitute while he and his brother were taking that famous Weinberg kidnapping case. I don't know when it was, but it was a long time ago. And we got into a conversation about practicing because every morning when we worked there, anybody that was connected to the court had to sit in the classroom and watch Bill and Arnold dictate to us, warming up for the trials or whatever we took for the day in the court. <laughs> Excellence, as you said. And I learned that. Also, to continue with the famous little ditties that I heard from him over the years, I came to know that he did win three years, one year. I mean, every other year. He won one year, his brother won the other year. It went on for six years. They finally took the seventh year. And guess what happened? Who won? It was a tie. <laughs> So I asked Bill, what happens then? And he told me the story that, well, it's like when Joe Lewis used to fight a challenger. They'd go all the rounds, and it was so close that it would have been a tie, but it wasn't. The former champion always won. So I said, who won the year before? He said, I did. <laughs> and that's how Bill got his fourth championship. <laughs> All right, you're nudging me. The only other thing I want to say is this. He did teach me the idea of becoming the top of the line in your field. And he quoted, like you said, somebody said about Joe DiMaggio. He said, remember the baseball players, the ones that hit 56, hit, get 56 hits in a year, 50, 60 home runs in a year? They're the ones that made the big money. If you're going to take a little insurance case all your life, you're not going to make the big money. You're a performer. And we have to be the best performers we ever were and will continue to be and teach that. And I learned that all from Bill. Uh, I'm Noah Collin. I'm Bill Cohen's grand nephew. Uh, some of you know that he taught me 
stenography from day one. Um, I was going to actually talk about his commitment to excellence, but I think Ed Varallo captured that pretty eloquently. So I think I'm just going to tell you about uh, how Bill is very selfless in court reporting and outside of court reporting. Uh, in his family, he's always there, despite being always there for his family of court reporters. And I just uh, wanted to say that although he taught me all the lessons of steno that I've, I need for a successful career, the most important lesson he taught me was to be willing to give to the people you love and to go the extra mile when people might not even be asking for it. So that's what I learned from Bill. I learned it from his shining example. So, uh, I'm John Prout, and uh, I'm from New Jersey. Don't hold that against me. <laughs> I did not work with Bill. I did not study under Bill. And I can't remember exactly when I met him. <laughs> You're saying, well, what is he doing up there now? Yeah, what are you doing here? Yeah. But I do recall that I, I met him at a, uh, a national convention, and I had heard about him from so many other people before. As, as others have said before me, he's a, a shining example, uh, a, a wonderful person. And he did give me some very good advice, though. I recall when we did meet, and I can't recall the city that the convention was in, but somehow we got to talking one morning about breakfast. And I had had breakfast in the hotel, and I guess I wasn't too satisfied with it or something. And Bill said to me, any time the convention is held in a downtown area, don't eat in the hotel, go out and walk two blocks, you'll find a good diner or a cafe. <laughs> and it'll be a lot cheaper and better. So, I didn't get real serious advice from him, but I got advice that I have passed on to a lot of people. <laughs> and I've used it myself. <laughs> but on a more serious note, I, I want to, uh, to toast Bill Cohen as a consummate professional, gentleman, and caring person. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Hi, I am Bliss Clark. And I'm a court reporter, and I've only been here for four years. I relocated from San Francisco to here, so I had all my training as a court reporter in California. But when I met Mr. Cohen, which is how me and Pat at the very end and Curtis <laughs> call him Mr. Cohen, <laughs> um, he has been a very big inspiration to me, and I totally appreciate his wisdom and what he has input into my career, because now I am a full-fledged court reporter, and I still go to him when I can, if the work is not too busy, to, to get information from him, because I still want to get all my letters behind my name. And I know that Pat and Curtis want to do the same thing. They want all those letters behind our name. So I appreciate Mr. Cohen, and I just want to say happy birthday. Uh, I have a lawsuit going on. Somebody took my speech. Uh, <clears throat> happy birthday, Bill. Bill, if I get any of this wrong, feel free to submit an errata sheet since I wasn't quite there. <laughs> you heard this call just now, and so my fellow Americans, no, we're going to do that. And some of my fellow Americans ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country, John F. Kennedy's inaugural address, January 20th, 1961. Almost two decades before those words were uttered, circa 1943, Bill and Arnold served in the Army Air Force Court Martial Court, then reported for the UN War Crimes Commission. Bill served a career in the Supreme Court, then another career in Southern District Federal Court, where he primarily reported at a lightning fast, highly intelligent, yet incomprehensible Judge Rizzo thereby relieving some pressure from his partners. His intrepid moral spirit now rages on as an independent and more released recently, a life preserver to the overburdened Southern District. All the while, like a shiny comet, as Isan now approaches the sun, a wake of qualified reporters flow in his trail. Some would say Bill promulgated and propagated our field of choice. I say he has strengthened 
this very country and our Constitution. Uh, as ours is a court of record forged by reporters in the heat of argument. Like so much dust in his stellar career, I, as a recipient witness, report the following. Again, happy birthday, Bill. <laughs> with, with, with these luminaries of court reporting present, permit me to introduce myself. Hello, I'm Vincent Bologna. 41 years ago, I began working with court reporters at Eastern District New York, making carbon setups and correction typing after high school. Following high school graduation, I went to Southern District doing back office work and correction typing after college classes. Following sophomore year at Brooklyn College, my dad was threatened with the loss of his job. Thus, I interrupted college studies to work full-time at Southern District. What great serendipity for me that Bill was there at that stage of, my, of his life and my life, my supervisor, Dorothy Alexander, informed that Bill teaches reporting. Uh, so is to thwart mental stagnation and to where the college grads were graduating into cabbies at that time in 1975, I and their office mate humbly approached Bill to plead for acceptance as students. In short, Bill rigorously interviewed us. Thus began sessions with our mentor, Bill. He encouraged my enthusiasm in reporting, as did the camaraderie of the Southern District reporters. Also, the price was right. All Bill ever asked was for effort, lots of effort, by us and by him. We took classes every morning between 8.30 and 9, with Fridays at 7.30 to 9, a minimum of two hours of practice nightly. We didn't even see the book. He would instruct us on home position, what and where to write verbally, then provide an arbitrary list to study. He is a realist, preparing one for the true rigors of reporting. I was blessed with a rarity that is cherished and as valuable as good parents. A very rare thing indeed. An outstanding mentor and friend. I learned theory from Bill using the first computer theory book. Then went to Stenotype Institute for a while, entering at the 120 class. They wanted to know where I learned to write, both in style and sharpness. Said I had the best, of course. Executing a formula of note reading, correction typing, smooth practice, I graduated and started reporting at age 23. I freelanced under Bob Shelley and Dick Portis at Cardinal Affiliated Zimmer Reporting for another three years. Then I joined Southern District in freelance capacity at age 26. Uh, I was appointed an official at age 29. All the while at Southern District, I partook in Bill's speed development classes along with Brad Raynor, Eric Brody, Lynn Van Den Handy, Sam Morrow, others, many of whom are either contest winners or qualifiers. He would dictate dense medical appellate opinions, court transcript, and New York Times editorials as literary to us. In retrospect, I realized we never heard any Wall Street Journal editorials. <laughs> oh, well, perhaps it wasn't delivered in New York, or maybe the Times effected more precise editing back then. Through the years, having attained New York State uh, CSR, RMR, the CRR status, though never a contest participant, I have managed to maintain life balance with a wonderful wife of 23 years. Today, actually, is my anniversary. Three fantastic children, Kurt and my wife would be here, except it's also my mother-in-law's 70th birthday party, and she wanted me. Three fantastic children, currently two grandchildren, a church family, an amazing career by maintaining my own in an office composed of many of reporting's contest winners and qualifiers, state, national, and international, and I pride myself on rarely having a black card. My foundation, and thus that of my family, is built upon the generosity of Bill's time and the investment in me. For that, I am forever indebted to his vision, altruism, belief in others, others, and mentoring. I am sure all our peers and other students will echo my perceptions of this wonderful person and great American. May God bless you, Bill, with good health, health, satisfaction, and joy. I know you will be, and I hope to be, around for your hundreds. Once again, happy 93rd, Bill. Good afternoon. My name is Curtis Williams. I have known Mr. Cohen for four years now, and Mr. Cohen is my tutor and mentor. Um, there has been a lot said about this wonderful man, and I just want to say I'll be very brief. Um, there's an old saying that when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And even though I had a rocky time learning stenography, there was a desire to learn, and I think that that is what prompted my meeting this great court reporting master. And I just want to say, Mr. Cohen, thank you for kicking my mm -hmm. butt in dictation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay.
Okay, my name is Tom Murray, and I am uh, at this point the oldest court reporter in the Southern District Court Report. Wow, really? That's to set the, uh, the context here. When I first started court reporting, Bill had retired from the New York State system and joined the federal system. <laughs> <laughs> we all knew it. I did some freelancing, and then I decided I'd come into the federal uh, courthouse. And when I did, um, I got accepted. And you always think you're hot stuff when you get accepted there. <laughs> So I waltzed in and I was able to do the computer and everybody thought, wow, that's good. And I did my first couple of jobs in court and Bill was reading my transcript. <laughs> <laughs> so the problem with court reporting is you can't fool yourself. I asked Bill, well, what do you think? And Bill said, uh, it, it's kind of slop. <laughs> well, I spent the next 25 years working on it. And I want, I'm so glad that Bill has some students here. His grandnephew, and you guys down there. I got to tell you something. This is what we do with our lives. We invest our emotions and everything that we've got in this business. What it takes is performing. It's like an opera singer That's what I say. takes everything you got. Right. Hal said it, but not as well. <laughs> <laughs> but I performed well. <laughs> you guys, I've watched students come out from Bill, uh, Bill's teaching over the years, and they're the best in the business. It's the best. There is no anything like it. So you understand that you are being taught by the equivalent of Babe Ruth, of our profession. And really take that to heart. My name is Pat. I am a student of Mr. Cohen. Speaking is not my forte. I'm going to say a little bit, but I'll cry. I'm a crybaby. <laughs> so, Mr. Cohen, I met him, uh, I was in school. And he came down and he needed a um, someone to speak four voice. So he had three people and he needed one more. So I went and I did the four voice with Mr. Cohen and I was going to the classes with him and I, uh, he said one day, I said, Mr. Cohen, I said, it's kind of hard for me to get. I'm, I'm not getting everything. And he says to me, well, you know what? You're too old to start in this profession. <laughs> <laughs> And I kept going. I said, Mr. Cohen, I'm going to do it. And I became a court reporter. I am a working court reporter. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. I stuck in there. I go to classes. And just about every transcript that I send out now, Mr. Cohen has to prove it before I send it. <laughs> so he's been great. I appreciate him. I've never met anyone like him. And all I can say is I just want him to be here forever. Um, I never had the privilege of working with this wonderful man, but I had the fantastic privilege of working with his identical twin brother, Arnold. He was my boss in Nassau Supreme. Turning out a great transcript was always the goal when you're working with these, these brothers. Chasing the elusive word is always a court reporter's nightmare, but uh, Don was also one of my teachers. I had the great privilege of knowing four gods of court reporting. One was Bill Cohen. The other one was his identical brother, Arnold. The third one was Nat Weiss. I didn't know him very well, but I did know him. Sorry. And the fourth one was Dominic Tursey. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The four yeah. gods of court reporting. <laughs> right. That's right. <laughs> I am so privileged. I love being a court reporter. I love being retired, too. <laughs> and thank you to all of you for, for such excellence in the field. And also, I, when Arnold retired, they had a wonderful story in Newsday, full page. 
This was a picture of Arnold taking the Japanese war crimes trial. Just substitute Arnold's face for Bill's. <laughs> I'll pass it around. Ladies and gentlemen, Don White. Yeah. Yeah. Bill, God bless you. Happy birthday. Uh, I went to, I, I came out of the army, I was a Greg writer. Bill, to this day, writes Greg and can read it. I write Greg, I have no idea what the hell it is. <laughs> but at that time, I went to Interboro Institute, and at Interboro, there was this amazing faculty. It was Bill, Arnold, Charlie Forster, David Horowitz, and Gloria Cassaro. Gloria was my first teacher, and then as things got better, he went up and up and up, and finally wound up with the master. And I, my, my story is this. I mean, a scholar. Excuse me, sir. Uh, when I took the RPR, and I, and I went for the examination, Bill was the dictator, and he said to me, you're going to take a merit. And I said, I'm, I'm nowhere near the merit. He said, we'll take it, and we'll see what happens. Well. Thanks to him, I took the RPR on the merit one day and passed both. He had that he had that confidence and he had the ability to drive me to do that because otherwise I just thought it was a crazy idea. But Bill is that kind of inspiration. I know that if Bill said you can walk on water, you can walk on water. It's guaranteed. Bill, God bless. Thank you for everything. Jay Baskin, um, past president of the uh, New York State Court Report Association, which is the oldest existing court reporting association in the country. And I'm very proud to have served almost 40 years after people of you that I could stand on your shoulders for your, the way you carried our profession and perpetuated it. So we're very grateful. We wish you a very happy 90th birthday and many, many more years to come. Good health. Hey. I first met Bill in the 90s at a speed contest, and I was at a dinner like this before the speed contest, and I was talking about something that might have been my forte, and Bill said, you know, the word forte is French, and it's not forte. There's no accent on it. It's fort. I, I said, uh, well, merci beaucoup. <laughs> and uh, I see Bill at every convention, and I'm so happy to see him there. And I, I decided to make a brief for Bill's name, because I like briefing, right? <laughs> so I thought I'd do... B plus H-O-E-N, you know, for Bill Cohen. So that's my brief for Bill Cohen, Bahone, right? <laughs> so one day he comes to my booth at the convention, and at my booth I've got the, this book out that I've written with tons of briefs in it and how to write short. He walks up to my booth, looks through it, looks through it, puts it down, and he says, you know, you don't need to write short like this. You just need to cut your hesitation, that's all. <laughs> he, he said, it doesn't make you write faster. I said, does too. He said, does not. I said, does too. He said, does not. So we stopped there. <laughs> a few minutes later, I run into Ed Farallo, and I said, I just had this debate with Bill Cohen about writing short. He said, I've been debating with Bill for decades. <laughs> But anyway, you guys have all heard, Bill has done practically everything that there is to do in court reporting. And you've heard the old saying, everyone remembers where they were when Kennedy was shot. Well, I remember where I was when he became the president of the New York Court Reporters Association. I was in my crib, because I was born in 1963. But, but what so much inspires me about Bill, he's done everything there is to do in court reporting. He, he's, he's done all the contests. He's, he's, he most impresses me that he goes to these conventions every year. He told me he's working on his real time. <laughs> Which I know a lot of young court reporters aren't working on <laughs> He takes his time to train other students. He continues to work every day. Each of those things inspire me. I hope I'm working when I'm 70, and if I live to be 80, I'm, I'm hoping that I'm working. So all those things are very inspiring to me, Bill, and happy birthday to you. 
And if somebody asked me the question, how would you epitomize court reporting, Mark, what would you do? I'd say I can do it in one stroke. C-H-O-E-N. Uh, I met Bill Cohen in the early 90s when I went to Southern District and became an official reporter. Bill was my mentor there. I learned so much from him. He made me a better reporter. Bill, I want to say thank you for sharing your wisdom, your time, and for your guidance. You are a great man, Bill Cohen, and an inspiration. Oh, I love you. <laughs> I am Mitch Lynn's husband, Bill. I want to thank you for your friendship. I want to thank you for lending us our your car to go to a wedding. <laughs> and, uh, and I got in the car and I started to drive, and the steering wheel came off. <laughs> so, so not only do I want to thank you for your generosity, but also your trust and faith. So, yeah. In 1965 was the first speed contest that Woody experienced. Uh, in the practice room was Doris Wong, Howard Lubin, the nostalgia here, uh, Dick Tuttle, Fred Tracty, Craig Windsor Wallace, Lou Dunbar, and two kids. <laughs> Two kids were Eddie Varello and Woody Wager. <laughs> Practice was fine. We read back and impressed the old timers. Then Bill Cohen and Matt Weiss walked in to assist. <laughs> Woody likens them to walking in the room were David Niven and Edward G. Robinson. <laughs> Eddie and Woody froze. We knew there was, a, there was greatness in the room. Today, Eddie and I are the old timers. Bill and Nat are older. How time plays tricks on us all. I am humbled to now be a colleague of Bill. I am grateful for the fine lessons of speed contest humility Bill has successfully passed on. No speed rider ever plays the immodest card, thanks to Bill. God bless you, you great legend. Uh, Woody ended up doing the, uh, the the work leading up to this event, which uh, we all appreciate, and I will express to Woody how much all of you do appreciate his efforts, and I know Bill does very much, and it really was difficult for Woody not to be here. I think he would have been here in a gurney if Marilyn didn't hold him back. But he sounded good when I spoke with him before he called in the middle of lunch, which is why I had to go away from the table. And um, uh, he's glad that it's going well, he wishes he'll be here, so I know you'll all contact him. Uh, I'm going to speak now, and, uh, and my tale can't take two minutes, but I'll take a little more, considering we have the time. Um, I received a scholarship, I uh, was raised in a children's home, to go to business college, and it was Interboro, and I learned I was really in some good company. And I, I finished in 11 months, so I asked if I could have the remainder of the unused tuition. And they said, of course, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> so, nice try. So, nice try. You know, from Brooklyn, you know? Even then. <laughs> even then. Even then. Even then. My clients didn't win very often, let me tell you. Um, anyway, um, so I ended up in uh, Interboro, and uh, I finished, and I went to night school, and Charlie Foster was teaching and moonlighting at night, speed. So I had the privilege of also being motivated by Charlie. I was about to become more motivated by Bill. Uh, he stopped in the middle of his dictation. He was doing the New York Times uh, stock quotations at 235. <laughs> <laughs> I have to give him a lot of credit to help later on. Um, he said, Jack Melico just left Florida. He's hiring court reporters and asked Bill Cohen if he knew anybody, and Bill called Charlie Foster in Interboro that night. And Charlie said, uh, Benowitz, you ought to go down there. You're 19, you don't have any ties. Well, before that, I was frustrated. Bill knew this. I took the circuit court exam when I was 18. I passed it, but I couldn't be, take a job. I had to be 21 in Connecticut. And I placed fairly well in the uh, hearing reporter exam, state of New York, out of 500. I, I, and I, I applied to unemployment uh, department. Uh, I was working for Motor Vehicle Bureau for a few months. 
And so I took the position, and I went down to Florida in 1961. I like to say, I went south and the Cubans came north. <laughs> now, I owe Bill an awful lot, because if it were not for Bill, I would not have had the opportunities that I had over the years. Meeting my first wife and having my two children, if I stayed here, they may have taken a different form and shape. But, um, and then uh, working with Jack Malicote and being uh, mentored by Jack and by Doris Malden and others. And I have to thank Taylor Reese, because he and the other three, three other court reporters were who left and made it possible for me to be in Miami. My wife and I have a log home up in Burnsville, North Carolina. We uh, go up there in summer and fall. And Taylor Reese has, happens to have a home and lives there year round. Uh, in North Carolina, half the year also, 10 minutes away from me. So it's really, really uh, something how things come around. Well, after that, I worked for Jack for eight years. I formed my own company, and I started going to conventions. But before that, while well, I worked for Jack, the 1964 convention came around, and I used to see reporters in Jack's office, because Jack was a third place speed champion himself, practicing every morning. And I asked, I won't mention names, I says, gee, uh, what are you doing? I said, we're practicing for the uh, merit exam and you know, the contest. And I said, well, can I join you? This was now three months before the convention. And I was told by this individual and others, mostly one, well, you need to really practice for six months because you really can't do it. So I didn't. I didn't practice. And the uh, convention rolled around, and uh, we're at a, conven a cocktail reception the night before, and Jack was drinking a lot of scotches. And he had a competitor uh, in Jacksonville called Thyra Ellis, who had a protege. And uh, she told him that she was also feeling her oats and spirits. I, I have a, a reporter who will beat any reporter you got. So what does Jack do? And his fourth scotch says, Penowitz, you better have him take that exam. <laughs> Not your fire. So I believe him at 22. I was very impressionable. So uh, but I said, but you have to pass all three parts of the merit. I don't care, you're going to have to take it. So I never failed a test in school, and I wrote scared. I took it at the luncheon. Uh, I heard the names being rattled off of, the, uh, of our mentors and, and idols in the profession. Uh, you know, Marty Fenson, Lee Beal, and, and others, and we'll go down the line. And uh, so I took, they were reading off the re results of the merit, and I, I got the first leg. No one knew who I was. And then they read off the second one, and they mentioned, mentioned right, about eight or nine, 12 names you know, down the list. And I got the second, Then all of a sudden there was a buzz in the room. Who's this kid? And then they read off the third, and I got all three parts of the merit. Wow. And, and this is what happens when you have a drunken boss who makes you write scared. And I don't think Bill mentioned that the other criteria is writing scared. That helps me a lot. So then comes the speed contest, and the first uh, leg, um, they read off about a dozen or 15 names and comes down third place in one part, Alan Benowitz. And the room was really buzzing. Then the second leg, I hear fifth, sixth, fifth, fourth. I says, good, the pressure's off. Marty Finson, fourth place. And then my name was read off, third place. Um, it was fifth and third in those two exams. And, of course, the person I said I couldn't do it was hiding. You know, the <laughs> and uh, then comes the, the, uh, the 280 uh, testimony. And, and by the way, I have to say that, and I'll be, I have to divulge, the reason I was in third place and not fourth place is that Marty Finson skipped the flap in his, tran in his transcription. Oh. Remember that? Tell people what that means. Okay. In your paper notes, right? In your paper notes. <laughs> right. When, 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 now, I'm not saying that I would have, I don't know by how many points, but that's a good reason why he probably didn't come in. I may have anyway, but we don't know that. But the point is, if you, when you turn up your pages manually, two pages stuck together. And, and he missed that flap. Anyway, it comes down to the uh, final leg. And uh, all the names started getting rattled off and down to third place, no mention, second, no mention. Good, the pressure's off. And then the winner was announced by Bill, it was uh, Alberta Buster. Okay? So I didn't come in. And Bill took an interest in me, and he marked the papers. He dictated the Connecticut exam and the hearing reporter exam. And he said, Alan, what happened? In the first four minutes, he had a perfect paper. What happened? 
in the last minute, the left bank was almost like chicken scratches. Well, what I didn't tell anybody until now, and there are very few people, is that I had a skin, I had a tumor, cancerous tumor removed from my left shoulder three months prior. I hadn't written it for two and a half months until two weeks before the contest. And my left shoulder went to spasm. But Phil took such a personal interest in me, I was touched by it, and I never forgot it. And I have to tell you that, in addition to meeting my current wife now, uh, and having an opportunity to do many things in the profession that were um, accomplished because of my uh, enthusiasm uh, spawned by Bill's interest in this student, they uh, wouldn't have happened. And Bill says, well, if you stayed in New York, you probably would have anyway. I said, well, not quite. I met maritime lawyer clients, aviation lawyer clients, and that's all over the world. That's segue way to my involvement in videotaping and video conferencing, and then photography. And now my full-time job will be after the end of this year as a fine art photographer and having an international exhibition in December during my fossil. So all these things probably would not have happened had Bill not sent me down to Florida. Thank you, Bill. Our appreciation. I have to say that uh, Don, Ed, and uh, Noah, and Woody are responsible for this plaque engraved in glass, which I'll read to you. Get some contrast here. William Cohen, reporter extraordinaire, a man of inimitable character, flawless talents, selfless, lacking professional, lacking professional and personal ego a mentor to thousands, a friend to all. <coughs> With gratitude, Noah P. Collin, Dominic M. Tercy, Ed Varello, Woody Wega, November 16, 2013. While you're walking down there, Bill, could you please tell us the secret to getting to the point you've gotten to in life so we can all <laughs> <laughs> It's very easy to answer that question. It's my twin brother. Because when we started Cinetype, they had tape recorders, but they were wire recorders. And they worked uh, like for 30 seconds and the wire would break. So we gave up on them, and my tape recorder, or, or digital recorder, was my twin brother. And if it weren't for his uh, dictation, and my dictation to him, his dictation to me, in the Army for three and a half years, we wouldn't have uh, gotten the speed that we did. Because when, when, we, when we went into the Army, we were at the uh, Stenotype about uh, 11 months. We had about 160 words a minute. And we were going to Queens College in the day. So we would do it only weekends. But uh, at 17 years of age, I guess uh, you have aptitude and you have the strength to do it. Then I still remember I had a uh, rash of uh, styes on my uh, eye, uh, one after another on both eyes. And my mother took me to uh, an ophthalmologist, and he said he has it's all tension, and people have uh, different weaknesses where it comes out if you're uh, working too tensely. Uh, and he has to stop everything, college and reading and spend time everything for a month. So uh, when we left, my mother said, well, how about that? I said, impossible. <laughs> <laughs> so well, this was like uh, October or November. I was drafted in December. And in the Army, two weeks after I was in the Army, I uh, went into basic training, all the skies disappeared. It was all due to tension. That, uh, and I, I got a lesson from that where now I have, for instance, a student who, uh, or a person who's working as a paralegal in the day and going to school to, uh, para to, some, uh, to get a degree in the evening. And she wants to take up standard at the same time. So I said, so she asked my advice. I said, don't do it because the tension of working all day, going to college in the evening, and then doing standard is too much. You're going to have a, a nervous breakdown. You're going to have something happen. <laughs> <laughs> You can wait till you graduate from college and then do it. Now, the other point I want to make that you'd all be interested in is I have a great short form. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm, uh, I'm doing a lot of uh, real time and uh, I'm converting uh, a lot of homonyms to uh, English. Uh, 
uh, it's not a good idea, even if it's one stroke, to write a lot of, a lot of letters because each one has to come out. <laughs> so I changed my guideline for environment, which is the like E-I-R-M-T. So I changed it to B-E-U. That's environment. B-E-U-L is environmental, and B-E-U, uh, B asterisk E-U-S is environmentalist. So that takes care of the environment. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm not opposed to, uh, people think that, oh, you, you write everything out. I do write out a great deal, but I have uh, short forms for very frequent words. Environment happened to be a word that I do expect the planning commission in NASA. And every case in the environment, environmental, and whatnot, so I used to get it. But I uh, want to thank all the speakers for all really, the things they said. I don't even recognize myself. But uh, it's been a quarter book. It's been very good to me. And uh, since in the Army, uh, the Army was desperate for anybody who knew shorthand. So as soon as you went in, uh, they, they knew what your, uh, I forget what they called it, something like an MOS or something. It was uh, a certain number. It was stenographer. So as soon as they saw that, they immediately put you into a judge advocate to, to be a court martial recorder. So when we finished basic training in Atlantic City, everybody, you know, we had it for about 80 of us, we finished the course. And they shipped them out to Florida, to Missouri, and to California, and everywhere. Arnold and I were shipped 100 feet down the boardwalk. <laughs> in the convention hall, that the, that the judge advocate had offices on the upper uh, level. So uh, I told the fellow, yes. the colonel, I said, Colonel, I'm not sure, uh, I've never taken a, 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 a court martial. I just uh, have learned this, but I haven't taken anything. So I said, I don't know if I have enough speed. He says, what is your speed? I said, about 175. He says, we have a fellow now that we're going to let go. He takes 50 words a minute. <laughs> Ten minutes. He's been taking our courts marshal. <laughs> <laughs> so in other words, they're desperate to have anybody uh, within the Army. So uh, we did it in the Army. But we also, uh, we didn't know too much about court reporting, except, since we had just taken it up by a side, except that uh, we heard 200 words a minute. Two, you got to get 200 words a minute. So we misinterpreted that. We didn't realize it was just sort of an easy 200 words. But we thought they meant 200 words a minute on an editorial or a legal opinion. opinion. So when we were practicing, we st I still remember in Atlantic City, we started out, uh, we did it between a half an hour and an hour every evening. Uh, and during the day, when the interstices of the day, we would time out takes. So we had the takes for the evening to dictate. And uh, we started out at the Times editorials, I still remember, at 130, just about holding on to it. And then when we started getting it more comfortably, 140, 150, and we ended up three and a half years later, we were taking about 210. Now, and, uh, and the reason I didn't have any short forms is I had no one to ask how to write something. Because uh, you know, I was just by myself in the army, so I just wrote every editorials. It not, doesn't give uh, much opportunity for short ones anyway. So I would just write syllabic. I still remember we used to get Czechoslovakia a lot. So I write Czechoslovakia. I used to doing it, and I got so I got to used to writing very uh, well syllabically. Right. You had to break it down and write it very quickly, and uh, unusual words and whatnot. So when we got out of the army. We, uh, uh, we free danced, and uh, they held a test for the UN after we were free dancing about two months. And about 25 people took it. Now, what was the incentive for regular reporters, and Ringo Rose, and like that? It was tax free. It was the same salary as the Supreme Court, but tax free because of the UN. So uh, we took this test. They had one vacancy, and my brother Arnold came out first, and I came out second. So uh, they just took the one, and he went into the uh, UN. And uh, I freelanced for about a year or so. And mostly, while well, I started out with skills reporting companies, and I don't know if it's anymore. But uh, after about three months, I took one uh, deposition in the surrogate's court, and uh, a reporter named Van Gelder was the senior reporter there. So uh, I forget his first name. 
But at any rate, he thought I did a good job, so he kept hiring me, and it was great work. I mean, very easy definitions. So you go all day long and get hundreds of pages out of the Then they announced a Supreme Court exam, and we took the Supreme Court exam, and it was statewide. <coughs> Uh, 800 reporters uh, took it, and it was a very hard test. It was all about nature up. And uh, 34 people of the 800 passed. So these were all 800 for official reporters. And uh, a, fellow, a phenomenal uh, reporter, uh, a lot like Alan Benowitz, uh, had an aptitude. And I know that because this reporter came out first on the list. Eight years before that, I was going to a dictation class. I was about uh, 15, 16 years old, and I was writing great then. The, uh, in the class were mostly lawyers, because law a lot of lawyers in 1939, 1940, took up a court of they couldn't get to make a part of the, not the heart, but the end of the depression, but the depression meant no jobs for lawyers. So they were taking every reporter. They turned to me and said, see that guy in there? And this fellow was reading back, two of the words are reading back, right back, for then So he said, you see that fellow? He said, I started with him. I'm working more hours than he is at home, because I'm a family man, I have to get this. So he says, I have 120 words in there. At the same time, he's got 200. So that's aptitude. And he was the only one in the whole city of New York, and all the details and whatnot, who had a, such an aptitude where whatever he took, he got three times as much out of it. And of course he wrote the T-H-E. <laughs> that was a sort of system he had. He just wrote everything out the way he heard it, but he had such an aptitude. So he came out first, Arnold came out second, and I came out third. So we immediately were, uh, and at that time you were appointed to where you lived. So it was the 10th Judicial District, Queens, Nassau, and Suffolk. And we lived in Jackson Heights, which is Queens. So uh, Al Morris, the chief reporter in uh, Queens, called uh, the three of us up to talk to us about the job. He says, look, you're only appointed, but we only have two vacancies. So uh, we're going to, and he said, uh, uh, let's see now, this didn't have to do with uh, Bob Shelley, who was uh, this phenomenal fellow. This had to do with another guy, a Greg Ryder, who beat all the sanitizers, he was 14th on the list of the 800, it was about half uh, manual trade writers and half sanitizers. So uh, Ed Van Allen, who was a phenomenal great writer, phenomenal. So when we went in, the chief reporter said, uh, Ed Van Allen has been probationary in this court for the last year, and the judges told me if he gets within the first three, the better appointed. He said, so I have my orders that he has to be appointed, even though he's third. But, as he said, so one of you two comes is going to be appointed. So he said, the Arnold will appoint Arnold, he's ahead of you. He said, fine. Well, I didn't expect to get that far anyway. Then, so uh, we all left, and Arnold was told he's going to be appointed, and he's going to go down. Three days later, I get a call from Al Morris, who's the chief reporter in Queens. I get a call from his Al Morris. He says, I want to talk to you. So I go in. He says, our chief judge is uh, Hallinan. He's a very, very powerful guy in Albany. He's, he's got a lot of influence. And he said, he called me in. He said, uh, are you making those appointments? And I said, yes. He said, you appointed those, all three? He said, I saw the list. Are you appointed two Cones and Van Allen? He says, no, I'm only appointing uh, Van Allen and one guy. So he says, well, why don't you appoint all three? He says, because there are only two vacancies. He says, I'll take care of that. He picks up the phone, he calls Albany, the chief of the civil service. And he says, look, this is the chief judge down here, and uh, we're very short of reporters, and he's on a Friday. He says, I want another slot uh, to uh, make another vacancy, and uh, we're going to make the appointments immediately. So they said, oh, whatever you say, judge. <laughs> <laughs> so now this chief reporter is telling me that, that this is what happened, and therefore you're going to be appointed in about a week. This is uh, near the end of uh, December of uh, 1949. So uh, they appointed me to Queens, 
they appointed Arnold to Suffolk, and Van Allen went to Nassau. So Arnold tells me, he says, you know, I've never been in a courtroom. I'm going out to the Supreme Court there, but I don't know what quite I'll do. So I said, I'll give you the advice. I had been in a municipal court for a year. I said, talk to the clerk of the court, what you should take, what you shouldn't take. He said, Tisora. So he goes out there the first day, and he sees this old guy, Fred Skinner. So he goes up to him, he says, oh, I'm very new, and I'm not too uh, aware of what I should take or what not. Speak up, Paul. He said, could, could, you, could you help me? So he, said, he looks at him and says, this is my first day on the job. <laughs> he was a political appointment. He got the job, and he didn't know any more than that. So, said, so I figured that uh, the only way to do it is to take everything. So he said, I took the calendar call, I took the motion, a lot of stuff that later I learned you don't have to take. But he also told me that it was a very uh, lucrative court because you always had three or four uncontested matrimonials every day. And each one uh, by the statute had to be transcribed. And in like 15 pages, so you, I don't know, what, maybe a dollar a page, but they got it. So he said it was money. So he uh, really got the bill for, for a month. And then he got a lot of orders from transcripts. Meanwhile, I'm in Queens, and I'm sitting there in the calendar part being signed. So I'm, I'm sitting there all day. And then about two or three times during the day, the court of four years of change to take down and stick with those exceptions. But otherwise, nothing to do. So I think it's where I'm going to go to law school. And he, at that time, there was a reporter in the Brooklyn Supreme Court, uh, because he's like 100 feet from Brooklyn Law School, he would immediately go to Brooklyn Law School.